Welcome to Walking Together, a podcast all about encouraging each other as we follow Jesus together. I'm your host, Dennis Lavelle. Let's start walking. Growing up as a kid, I loved watching Wiley Coyote and Roadrunner. And I appreciated the fact that Wiley Coyote never gave up, but he was totally owned, totally controlled by Roadrunner. If you love DC Comics, you know that Superman only has one weakness. What is it? That's right. He is owned by kryptonite. Now hang with me here just for a minute. I love my wife's chocolate chip cookies. They are incredible. I think most of the world's geopolitical problems could be solved if we could get all the leaders around the table eating a plate full of Laura's chocolate chip cookies because they will own you. Well, what does all that have to do with anything? Well, today I want to look at Luke 12, where Jesus is teaching to a large crowd and he's going to deal with the subject of something owning or controlling us. And someone interrupts Jesus to ask a question. In verse 13, we read, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. This guy has the nerve to interrupt what Jesus is saying and says, My brother and I are getting into an argument, and he doesn't think I deserve half of my dad's inheritance. So please tell him he's wrong and that he has to share it 50-50 with me. And it's been like that for thousands of years. When someone in the family dies, the siblings start arguing over the belongings. Before my mom died, she went through the house and put stickers on the back of everything and wrote our names on them. This puzzle belongs to Dennis. Some of my jewelry belongs to Debbie. Those photos belong to my little sister, Danielle. She didn't want anybody arguing about silly things like worldly possessions. And this is the point Jesus was trying to make as well. In verses 14 and 15, Jesus says to this guy, Hey, listen, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Then he goes on to say, For a man's life is not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. So Jesus makes it clear. I'm not here to settle your fight about your family's possessions. But I will tell you this, be on your guard against greed. Well, why? Because your life is not about the abundance of stuff that you can collect and possess. And Jesus says it's very easy to slip into this kind of thinking where the abundance of possessions becomes your motivation for life. And this crowd that's listening just kind of look at him with this blank stare. And in verse 16, he's going to use a parable to make it clearer for the listeners. He says, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. So he uses an example of a farmer who's had some bumper crops in the past. Well, how do we know that? Because he's rich. And the fact that he's rich tells us that he already has more than he needs. He has extra. He lives every day with his abundance. And now another harvest is coming in. And the problem is that he didn't have enough room for the new crop. He already had extra. Now he's going to get extra on top of his extra, and he has nowhere to put it. So verse 17 says, he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. Now let me ask you this. Do you actually feel sorry for this guy? Do you have any sympathy for his dilemma? (laughs) No. Why not? Because he already has enough. More than enough, in fact. He says, oh no, what am I going to do? I have no place to put my extra surplus because all my storage areas are maxed out. And if you're thinking what I'm thinking, and probably what the disciples thought, if you have too much, I'll be happy to take some of that off your hands. I could use some of that extra that you won't even miss. You see, it's easy for us to see greed in his life, but he can't see it in his own mirror. And the same is true in our life. When we have extra money, what do we do? Well, some people actually put that in the bank and save it for a rainy day. But most just go out and buy more. If you get a pay raise, you usually make some little modifications here and there in your lifestyle 
to match the extra money that you're now earning. And it doesn't matter if our attic or basement is already full. We just keep getting more. We'll even rent a storage place if necessary, right? And this is where the rich man found himself. He didn't know how to squeeze all his new stuff in his current storage facilities. Now notice, he already had barns. It's plural, not one, but a minimum of two, and more than likely, several barns. But they were all at max capacity. So instead of getting rid of some of it, he comes up with a different plan. He says in verses 18 and 19, this is what I'm going to do. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones, and I'll store all my fruits and grains and all my goods in there. And so he's thinking, I've got a lot now, and that should last me for the rest of my life. So now it's time to start living and enjoying what I've squirreled away. Now, at this point in the story, the man has three options, as I see it. Give some of his harvest away, or he could sell it, or he can hoard it. So he goes for that last option. He makes his choice and decides to demolish his current storage places and build bigger ones. And up till now, he's been a very good businessman. And he thinks, this is it. It's my last big harvest. I can live the rest of my life financially relaxed and comfortable. And that seemed like a good plan. But God had a different plan. In verse 20, we read, But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul shall be required of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? God calls him a fool. To which we'd say, A fool? Isn't he a wise man? I mean, he's invested for his future. He's successful in business. Why does God call him a fool? A fool in biblical language doesn't describe a lack of mental ability, but a lack of spiritual discernment. And according to Jesus, a fool is a man who leaves God out in his decisions. And he didn't consider the possibility that his tomorrow might be canceled. Now, imagine this scenario. Tonight at 6 p.m., you just finished dinner. You decide to sit in your recliner and relax for a few minutes. You flip on the TV, and suddenly you hear, we interrupt this program to bring you a very important announcement. Your tomorrow has been canceled. In other words, you are going to die tonight. Now, some of you would be mad because you would want at least a few days or maybe a week to get everything in order before you die. But let me ask you, how many people do you know in the past year who has had their tomorrow suddenly canceled? A mom, dad, co-worker, neighbor, a child? Some of you already know that there's no certainty for a tomorrow. Maybe you've personally experienced a heart attack or a serious car accident, or maybe you're fighting cancer or pneumonia or covid all of those things herald the announcement, hey, you cannot count on having a tomorrow. And I know that's hard to hear, but every one of us is only one breath away from having our tomorrow canceled. Now, James, the brother of Jesus, tells us that our lives are short. He describes it as a mist, a vapor. It's here, then it's gone. And for many, their philosophy in life is let's get as much as we can while we're living. But what happens is that we find ourselves collecting and clinging to stuff that our kids will end up fighting over when we're gone. And what's worse is that whatever you've worked so hard for, chances are your kids probably aren't going to want it anyway. And it's going to be thrown into the dumpster, given to Goodwill, listed on Etsy, or sold at a garage sale for 50 cents. And I know that's not very encouraging, but it's true. Jesus says, be careful how attached you get to stuff because your stuff can own you. It can control you. And you may think that you own the stuff, but for many of you, your stuff owns you. And Jesus is telling them, give your stuff away. Share what you've been given when people have a need. And this group that Jesus is speaking to didn't understand what Jesus was saying 
because that kind of thinking was opposite to how the culture operated. The Greek and Roman culture was based on one word, liberalitas. That was stamped on all their coins. It was the idea of giving to please the recipient. So the whole idea of generosity in this culture was to find someone who could do something for you and do something for them first so they will owe you. So Jesus walks into this culture and says, in my kingdom, you give and don't expect anything in return. In my kingdom, you give or lend knowing that you may not get it back. In my kingdom, you do for others because they have a need, not because they can pay you back. Then he goes on to say in Luke chapter 6, he says, but love your enemies, do good, and lend hoping for nothing. Jesus says, do good to your enemies. Well, why? Well, you know they're not going to pay you back. And so he tells them, you have to change the way you think about generosity. As my followers, you do not do for those who can return the favor. You do for those who cannot return the favor. Because that is what your heavenly father has done for you. And the bottom line to what Jesus is saying is that he says, I want you to do good to those who cannot or will not do anything good for you. Every week when you put your tithes and offerings in the box or if you give online to your local church, it is an opportunity to do good to those who cannot or will not do anything for you. Now, let's wrap this up by going back to the man in Jesus' parable. This man had success, satisfaction, and security. What more could he possibly want? Well, he wanted a tomorrow to enjoy it all with. And there's a lot of people that are like this rich man. They feel secure. They plan to be 100. They refuse to think of death and eternity. You might say, well, I don't like thinking of death. Well, yeah, neither do I. But it's going to happen. And I still think of myself as someone in their 20s until I get up really quick and my left knee doesn't want to come with me. Well, no matter how many vitamins you take, you will still die. All of us face eternity, either in the presence of God or apart from him forever. And death caught this man when he least expected it. So let me ask you a question. What if you had a guarantee that you would not die tomorrow? Would you live any differently? Well, don't presume that you will have a tomorrow to deal with your relationship with Jesus. And here's the takeaway from the parable. When our hearts are focused on our stuff, we don't give God credit for what he's done. Read verse number 18 again. How many times does this man say, I or my? Verse 18 says, this is what I'm going to do. This is what he's thinking in his mind. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain for all my goods. The words I or my appear at least six times. Did you catch that? I don't have enough room to store my harvest. Well, that harvest belonged to God. It wasn't his. And you might push back and say, well, I'm not like this guy because I don't have that kind of extra. Yes, you do. If you've gone to McDonald's or eaten out this month, you have extra. If you've rented a movie from Netflix or even have Netflix or Hulu, you have extra. If you put gas in your car this month, you have extra. If you've bought an ink cartridge for your printer, you have extra. All too often we make plans with our extra, but leave God out. And the Bible says we're fools for doing that. Now, here's where his thinking was wrong. Here's where it was flawed. Number one, he assumed that he was the source of his extra. He didn't provide the sun and the rain. God did. And number two, he assumed his extra was for him. The problem wasn't that he was rich. His problem was that he didn't realize why he was rich. Verse 21 says that this is what will happen to us if we lay up treasures for ourselves and we're not rich toward God. Well, what does that even mean, to be rich toward God? 
when I want you to read verse 33 at the close of this podcast. Rich toward God means that you give what you don't need to those who are in need. When you are blessed with more than you need, it is to be shared with those in need. God desires that we take what he has given to us and use it to bring others into a relationship with him. And again, the problem wasn't that he had extra. It was that he thought the extra was for him. He missed an opportunity to be rich toward God. And this man experienced a total loss. He lost everything he had worked for in his lifetime. All of it was given away, not because he was generous, but because he died. Until you can share what God has given to you, not out of guilt because someone else is giving, but because you realize you have more than you need. But until you can share what God has given to you, until you get to that point, you will always ask the question, why don't I have more? When you are blessed with more than you need, it is to be shared with those in need. Be rich toward God because he's been so rich toward you. Thankfulness and generosity is how you break the habit of greed in your life. Well, thanks for tuning in today. I hope this has been a blessing to you. If so, share it with a friend, post it on social media. I'd love to hear your feedback. Let me know how this has helped you. Go be generous today and be a blessing to someone. Take some of that extra that you don't need and give it to someone who's in need. We'll see you next time. Thank you.